Hey everyone, welcome to another exciting episode of Coffee and Commerce. Super excited to have our first guest with you today, Ryan Steelberg, the co-founder and president of Veritone. Thanks for joining us, Ryan. Thank you, it's great to be here. Absolutely. Um, so Ryan, tell us a little bit about Veritone's founding story and your background in entrepreneurship leadership. What? Uh, well, my brother and I have been in kind of the ad tech, martech space since the uh, mid nineties. So we started our kind of first ad tech, ad delivery company in 1993. It was called AdForce. Um, and we, we, we were like one of the first kind of distributed ad serving platforms back in the early days of the web. Um, you know, back then it was basically just us and double click uh, version 1.0 competing. Um, and back then we used to literally show off the size of our data centers. Right. And and um, so it was, but it was an exciting time, you know, during the emergence of just explosion of interest in the web. Sure. Um, and I think that, the, 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 you know, in that process of building AdForce, um, you know, it was kind of our it honed us in on our very early skills of dealing with tons and tons of amount of data, period. When we're when you're serving, you know, 40 million ads a few minutes and you're trying to serve the right ad to the right person at the right time. Um, that is in a trend, you know, very challenging. It's gotten a lot easier today with the advances of, of compute and, and, and cloud and whatnot. But, you know, we kind of had the early sort of inkling of, wow, there's so much data here. You know, this is, you know, simple algorithms are not going to work here. We're going to need advanced AI at some point to help sort of pick the right ad. So our whole career from, you know, we've done several different businesses. Um, you know, we took that first business public. Um, a, a, another ad tech business we build up called DMARC Broadcasting. We actually sold to Google, um, and we, my brother and I headed up all of Google's offline ad efforts for a few years. So we've been in—I would say—we've been in the ad tech business. If, if, if there's a place to serve a target ad, that's us, right? And we've been doing that, and and there in lies the opportunity, which was the impetus for Veritone, is spot-based you know, commercial based advertising has been mm -hmm. under a lot of pressure as this, as we shift to the mobile device, there's not a lot of screen real estate. You're pretty much focused on the content and people I mean, just were overwhelmed with the number of, of ads. So we started looking really while we were at, still at Google at native integrations. So branded integrations. So such as, you know, the, the sign of the background of your video, right? Highbury. Let's pretend that says Coca-Cola, right? And so I don't have to leave the experience of engaging with the content. And obviously there's ways to weave in organic based advertising. And there's many different flavors of that today. The problem with that, it's not transactional. So how can I potentially look at, if I'm doing a, a native integration, let's you know, pick two examples, a, a live read on the radio. So, sure. it, so it's, a, it's Mike and Mike in the morning on ESPN radio and they're, they weave in into their program. Right, if you don't mind for, for the audience, just tell them, uh, the, just explain what a native integration is. For those sure. that don't know, yeah. so to get more context out. So, so again, if you're, if you're, you know, different, different groups. So let's say I'm reading an article and inside the text of the article, instead mm -hmm. of an ad on the side, they actually talk about a product or service in the article itself, right? And that'd be a text version of a native integration. Sure. In, in movies, we see them all the time. You know, Jerry, any Jerry Brockheimer movie, you'll see uh, Chevrolet cars, right? In every, you know, no matter what scene it is, there's a different Chevy car. That would be another example of a branded integration. Um, and, then, and then obviously um, a lot what we deal with is YouTubers and radio hosts and podcasters, such as we're talking here, is we, we during this conversation, I may go off on, on a little diatribe about you know, why I think LifeLock is important to protect my sure. security. Okay, so those are all different flavors of, of native integrations or embedding the ads with and into the within content. the content. Yep. Right. So the challenge with that is when you're trying to evaluate a campaign, particularly if you're running this campaign across 100, 1,000, 45,000 unique influencers a month, you can't have humans sitting around and analyzing all this. So several years ago, um, this is um, we came up with the idea is could we build a platform where I can ingest you know 100, 1,000, 20,000 unique streams, piece or pieces of content, whether that's a a linear audio stream, a linear television stream, a podcast, a YouTube, could I ingest it? Could I index it fast enough with AI? So bots like facial recognition, object detection, NLP, and can I do all that in a multivariant way? So in effect, I can answer a simple question is, yes, they cleared the ad, yes, they followed the brand briefs, and boom, we can now look at the ad efficacy, just like we can do kind of with spot-based ads or display-based ads. 
but now I have that same resolution for native, native integrations. So it's similar to years ago uh, when there were like PR services that would check placement within newspapers and traditional PR, um, albeit this is far more complex because yeah. to your point, it's within the context of additional content. So to your point, like seeing the hybrid sign behind me, it's not just a matter of being able to simply recognize that on a white background, but within the context of something else. So it makes it far more difficult. Yeah. And so that was, and so we were successful in that initial implementation and the benefits were almost immediate. First mm -hmm. of all, we were really focused on the ad. So you can create a 360 now um, view of the ad, your, your ad program, whether it's a spot or a native. And, and that enough, we were really excited about, right? That was the impetus for actually founding Baritone. But very quickly, almost all these other broadcasters, networks kind of reach out and say, hey, this, this index is, can be used for a ton of different things. You know, programmatic highlight generation or um, enable us better search and discovery of our content, um, optimization of our media asset management system. And so in, a, in essence, it now Ver, you know, Veritone for media and entertainment companies is we are, we are kind of the ubiquitous player that is helping index audio and video content at a, at a very high degree in terms of accuracy and precision that now media companies have used that as part of their workflow for a multitude of different things. And that's, and that's how it's kind of expanded. And so media and entertainment has um, been our primary focus. And then mm -hmm. just two years ago, we started doing a lot of work with public safety and justice. Um, so a lot of our software is used by law enforcement agencies to redact, you know, so if they're trying to prepare um, footage that you see about like body cameras, we're dealing in this little zeitgeist right now in our life. But when they try to obfuscate my face or any other personal identifiable information or public record request, they use the same AI framework to try to sift through that content, find, you know, that personal identifiable information and, and obscure it, right, with a cloud or some type of, of um, uh, you know, object to cover up the face, right? Yeah. So now, so that's our two core businesses: public safety and justice, and media and entertainment. And then, Ryan, in terms of uh, so with our audience, right? What everybody who's listening in is focused on commerce. Is focused on um, either digital commerce. Some of them are uh, retailers. So omni channels are really kind of key critical component of what we talk about. What, um, what we lean in on. Um, it's interesting. I read a recent study from Gartner that predicts that around 80% of all customer interactions will be managed by AI tech yeah. by the end of 2020. Yeah. So I'd love to lean in on what you're doing in the e-com space, both in terms of content licensing, um, how AI provides a more seamless omni-channel experience and personalization. Let's talk about that a little bit as it relates to those that are watching and what they can learn and adapt and, and leverage for AI. Sure. So the area we focus, so um, we have a division called Baritone One, and it's mm -hmm. actually an advertising agency. Um, you know, we're we're relatively big in the podcast space um, for for distribution, all things audio, as we talked about earlier, YouTube, and we do represent a a, a, a few dozen marquee um, both traditional retail and um, direct to consumer e commerce partners. Mm -hmm. um, and they range from like Roman for you know for men's telehealth. Sure. To, to Uber, LinkedIn, you know, Dollar Shave Club. Um, these have been partners for us for a long time. And so all of them, it, it, you know, so AI need one for them is, my God, there's a lot of data. We need to figure this out, right? We're getting so much, you know, now data. Um, and it's, it's simply impossible for us to, in real time, build better audience-based models. And what right? kind of data specifically are we talking about here? Well, I mean, first it's first party data. So I mean, any and all transactions. So anytime a new driver, you know, signs up for Uber, a new fare is generated, where they're logging into, what's this? What's the volume, or, or how big is the average fare? Just in their core business, they have all these metrics that they they haven't really necessarily been able to transaction. Exactly. So part part of that is understanding just the, the the data and being prepared to being prepared to harness the data that we are already producing. Mm -hmm. Then you have to marry that with their media campaigns, right? So if we are now representing their ad investments, whether that's for online or in a podcast, you have to bring all this together, right? Are there correlations? Obviously, you can do short-term attribution modeling, right? So if something happens over the air on traditional radio, the classic aperture of, of, of benefit that, they, that that channel gets is about eight minutes, right? That's the radio kind of benefit. But most people are omni-channel. 
So now if I'm running some radio and then I'm running some TV, how do I bring all this data together? Because now, as we talked about earlier, I can inform the, the our client Uber of exactly when any ad ran, whether it was a pre-produced spot or native integration. And so now we can start to look at the real-time correlations between investment, spend, and clearance with what's actually happening in their own proprietary data set. And that has been a phenomenal oppor you know, growth opportunity for, for us and our clients, um, where we've been able to really show, hey, you know what, everything seems correct here, but that just, it's the wrong type of customer, right, that keeps coming back. I mean, we're spending a fortune and their average size purchase is, you know, a fraction of a different demographic. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're spot on. Yeah, I mean, we see this a lot um, with our clients as well, and just generally in the space where, to your point, there's a lot of data, and depending on the size of the organization, and if you're if you're even a smaller um, e-tailer or you're a smaller brand uh, building direct to consumer uh, experience, even at that level. Uh, I think there's quite a bit of opportunity for AI. Part of it is, I mean, we use AI as a blanket term. We know that generally speaking within the market they do, but a lot of it's actually machine learning versus AI. Right. Um, but leveraging kind of machine learning even at a very small D 2 C level can be very impactful in terms of personalization. And so to your point, I think what many individuals that, that are watching that I want them to understand is that once you start getting this transactional data, at a surface level, what a brand will look at is, okay, what is average order value? What are my customer demographics, et cetera? But what happened is over the last few years with the increased number of brands advertising on Facebook, Google, et cetera, saturation increases. And now you can't just look at that surface level and say, okay, I'm gonna spend $10 to spend uh, to sell something that's $20. Every brand, every organization, as, as Ryan was mentioning, whether it's Uber, whether it's Dollar Shave Club, whomever, is looking at lifetime value of customers and customer cohort segmentation to say, these are the types of customers that end up spending more with us. Or in the case of Uber, probably uh, this type of driver is gonna generate more revenue for us or this whatnot, right? So what they're able to do is take that data at the front end and leverage it to identify more of those people on the back end, right? 100%. And I think one, one issue that more independent, smaller um, e-commerce retailers and others have is, we only you only have a limited slice of the view of the customer, right? And you can try to overlay it with Experian data and all these other data sets. But at the end of the day, I mean, what what you know there and there's obviously groups of consortiums getting together and saying, you know what, I, you know, I'm selling you know women's undergarments and you're selling. So the bottom line is, people, you know, these, you know, I just don't buy Roan T-shirts or whatever. And so one th you know, thing that I think groups need to do is they need to start working together, independent retailers, e and share their data sets and allow groups like Veritone and others to help them build more you know, ubiquitous models or diverse models of their users, right? You can't you wow. can't compete against Amazon who has an omni view of literally whether I'm buying bananas or a, a weight set, right? It's just, it's such a powerful advantage. And as you know, that, that, that advantage increases exponentially every single day. So I, I you know, I think the, it's not too late, for where, but I think that any independent must make sure that they maintain the integrity of their data and be willing to share or work with other e-tailers. But it needs to be, we're talking hundreds of them getting together. So we're, so you really could look at, wow, I have good resolution on 800 million people. And, and, and so it's a, it's a collective effort on the data side. So I think that and, and machine learning, as you know well, it's all about training data. So if you don't have enough input function you're never ever gonna get make your engine smart enough to really make a big impact. So, so Ryan, let me ask you something uh, that that is related and somewhat uh, to the side, but but something that I've been very curious about uh, recently and trying to figure out because to your point. Uh, so, to kind of recap what you're mentioning right now, each retailer, each brand has their own first party data. The reason why we we as in like everybody basically pushes direct to consumer is because as a brand, you get first party data. Meaning if I buy this bubbly, which I love, it's not sponsored, but I just love bubbly. But if I buy bubbly direct from bubbly, bubbly knows who I am. And so they can start to promote, they can start understanding how much I buy, get a better sense of the customer. But if I buy bubbly from whole foods, bubbly has no idea who I am. So part of what, uh, what is a question for me in terms of moving forward, I'd love to get your insight on this is, 
If I buy from Bubbly, Bubbly knows who I am. If I buy Bubbly from Whole Foods, Bubbly has no idea who I am. They just know what flavors they're selling, how frequently, so on and so forth. Do you imagine, do you think that at some point in the near to midterm future, retailers will start to share customer data with brands in one form or another to not only because they want to, because the brands want it, but somehow to impact and positively impact the retailer experience? Yeah, I, 100%. I think having a, a data management platform with the right controls, I think is a prerequisite for future success for really anybody who's not a Walmart or an Amazon. It, it has to happen, right? And it, it's gonna have to start with enough important impactful brands, frankly, demanding that they have access to that data and it's shared, right? So in effect, and, but it's got to potentially happen the other way. If you really are trying to optimize, you know, the, the, the distribution of your product and sales through Best Buy, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's going to have to go the other way. So if you have a direct consumer offering and you're collecting first party data and, and um, Best Buy is collecting their own first party data, there has to be a collaboration, right? And, and then Best Buy needs it. Not like they're doing that great anyway. So I think it's, in the, it's a DMP that's going to have to have different permission sets and ownership sets. But I do think, think that will provide all the independence, a significant opportunity for growth in the future. Ryan, last question for today. Uh, talk to our audience. How can they best, if, even if they can't leverage AI or machine learning, what can they leverage from the fundamentals around machine learning, around data sets, around pattern recognition that can positively impact themselves and direct to consumer? Well, first of all, you better have, you better understand quickly what your data schema is, right? What data do you guys truly have that is repeatable? Are you appropriately ingesting it and indexing that data set? So just make sure you have controls over your data, right? Number one. Number two is you start to, you, 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 like, in effect, what, what areas of those data sets do you believe um, have some input function to the performance of your website or whatever service you're offering, right? You have the intuition of how your business works. Yeah. So AI, of course, AI, yeah, real quick, AI is really good at helping optimize existing processes, but it's the next level of saying, okay, geez, how do I then, you know, take it to, the, what's the force multiplier effect of AI? Bots, as we just talked about, customer service bots and AI, I think they're great. You know, I think all of us can, you know, can, can it's frustrating sometimes we feel like we're being pampered just to stay on with a with an artificial uh, customer service rep long enough to appease us. But I do think that, that you know that that will provide a big benefit. But overall, I think people just save your data, protect your data, and work with companies candidly on the advertising side, like groups like Veritone. Go play and learn Alteryx, right? Go find these ETL platforms, these data platforms. There's off the shelf low code tools out there. Little plug for us: we have one called Automate Studio that allows you, you don't have to have engineers always trying to munge this data. They have tools out there that you can actually start acting upon, putting those into practice to, to improve the efficiencies and sales of your business. Ryan, this is an absolute pleasure. We'll have to have you on uh, longer next time. We'll definitely schedule that. Thank you so much for joining uh, and enjoy the rest of your day. Be safe, guys. Have a good day. Thanks, you as well. All right, folks, up next, we have a gentleman that I admire deeply. Uh, a gentleman that helped us build Vayner Commerce, and we're very excited and honored to have him back, Sabir Semerkant, who is currently the founder of Growth by Sabir. Sabir, welcome. Thank you, Zubin. It's uh, it's such an honor to be here, and uh, it's it's amazing to reconnect again. What is going on, my man? How have you been? Very good, very good. I, I think we are living in interesting times, my friend. <laughs> Say the least. <laughs> to say the least. Um, so the, for those of you, I'm going to let Sabir tell his story right now. But for those of you that don't know Sabir, Sabir is a, an e-commerce marketing growth extraordinaire. So the reason why, aside from the fact that we love Sabir and I'm excited to have him on, but the reason why I think he's going to add so much value for this conversation, we're going to flip the script. We're just going to do questions at the end, but we're just going to go, Sabir, tell us about yourself, what you do, and then let's go into questions. It's good. We have a ton of questions, and Sabir is uh, is your man in terms of being able to answer these questions, give you value, um, and I highly encourage that uh, you all follow Sabir on uh, Twitter as well, at Sabir S. Um, Sabir, take a few minutes, tell us about your background, bring us up to today, and then we'll jump into the first question. 
Sounds great. Um, so I'm the founder of uh, growthbysevere.com, a uh, uh, former founder of uh, Vayner Commerce with Gary Vaynerchuk. Uh, and uh, uh, Zubin, uh, I, I guess my successor, right, at, uh, at, at Vayner Commerce. Uh, I've been in e-commerce and growth hacking. Uh, I'm one of the OGs. Uh, so I got involved in, with the internet before e-commerce and then e-commerce came about and I pivoted to e-commerce and I've been in it for that long time. Helped uh, launch quite a lot of brands over the pa past uh, 20 years. Uh, mm -hmm. Iconic brands, Vitamin Shaw, Perry Alice, uh, Ashley Stewart. There are so many of them uh, in there. Uh, ba basically the kind of the founder role in these e-commerce uh, ventures, as well as I did my own uh, e-commerce startup or agency uh, prior. Uh, so um, quite, quite a bit, everything re revolved around e-commerce and it's not, the role is not uh, based on, my role is not based on necessarily tech. That's one po portion of it, small portion now. Uh, the, the bigger part is actually understanding and, and growth hacking any business and helping transform businesses um, and change their narrative from being a traditional, whatever you want to call them, manufacturer, retailer, you insert the word. Anything that starts with traditional is my enemy, basically. Uh, so I take that and, and convert that narrative to being a powerhouse of an e-commerce brand that happens to have that traditional whatever X <laughs> label they have. Uh, have been involved and besides uh, uh, you know growth by severe, I am I am a strategic advisor uh, on Shark Tank for specifically for yeah, a recurring guest shark Matt Higgins uh, who's who heads up uh, RSE Ventures and um, and I've been involved in quite a lot of things. So Recently, funny enough, my timing is always perfect. Uh, so I launched uh, Growth by Severe on March 1st of 2020. And uh, and my first goal for the first two weeks was to actually go and find a WeWork location so that I can find a space where I can go into the city. That meeting, I can tell you, uh, it was scheduled two weeks later and yep. New York City was complete lockdown. So. <laughs> Uh, so that actually, I invested in a home office and, and started working, and and literally we've been helping businesses uh, grow their uh, grow their business, and it's an incredible time right now to um, to grow your business. A lot of people are shell shocked, uh, and and they don't spring to action. But right now is the time, incredible time, uh, to invest in your business to grow your business. You, you can see a scale up like this. Uh, a hockey stick uh, growth for whatever business you have right now is the right time to do it. Excellent. Sabir, thank you so much uh, again for joining us. Uh, let's jump into questions. I think that's the most value that the folks can get uh, at home here. So first can we promise before you start, can mm -hmm. we promise we, you and I will deliver a million dollars in, in value uh, in, in, in Sabir, between the two of us? saying my friend if we don't deliver a million dollars <laughs> worth of value i would like people just to stop watching this show um, <laughs> Perfect. all joking aside the entire purpose of this show is to move the conversation forward and to make sure people at home are getting value uh, yep. and, and 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 the the beauty of this show um is that we have people from all walks of life and at different levels of uh entrepreneurship as well as business we've got individuals that are uh currently trying to figure out what they want to do what they want to sell online, how do they want to leverage digital to make a living for themselves. We've got those that have been doing it and want to grow. And then we have individuals that work at large multinational corporations that want to get a better sense of direct to consumer. And so that's the beauty of, of this show. And so I think in terms of value, absolutely. We want to make sure everybody gets value. And that's why oftentimes we're talking like Ryan speaking at a very kind of enterprise level, um, which is fantastic. I just want to make sure that everybody that is not at that level yet still gets value from the conversation. That was an awesome interview. Uh, while I was in backstage, I was listening, actually. That was, yeah, that was, that was great. That was fantastic. And I think that uh, right before we get to our first question, I think the one thing that I would really encourage everybody to do um, is just brush up on machine learning, AI, uh, because the, the term AI is just thrown out to mean so many different things. Um, but really, a lot of what uh, organizations will benefit from is really machine learning and pattern recognition um, because AI then does the thinking and finding and whatnot for you. But to Ryan's point, what he's basically saying is you're selling stuff online. And when he was talking about data schema, the nice thing about being on Shopify or one of these platforms is the data schema is pretty much set. 
So you know the information that you have available to you is there. But the key is to understand what matters. So the, what signals matter? Um, what I often talk about is, is like a Tesla or a self-driving vehicle where when we're sitting in a car, we're looking at all sorts of stuff, but that vehicle is making decisions based on maybe five out of a thousand different signals because it knows what signals matter. And so even in your business, it's really important to understand what signals matter. Anyway, uh, sorry for the tangent. Let's jump into our first question. So our first question comes in from Auden Tessman um, or Auden Test Porch at Auden Tessman. Hello, Zubin. Uh, so he had to close physical store and pivoted to online only in order to drive traffic without built in uh, niche digital magazine interview article based. So turn my little leather shop into a media company. How do I keep building brand while still getting sales? The most important question. Sabir. Sounds good. I, I think number one. Uh, uh, so Auden is on, on, the, on the right track, right? Content is king. You know, you have to produce. Uh, so there are different types of content when, when it comes to e-commerce, right? For, from an e-commerce sales standpoint, right? One obvious one is you talking about your product all day long, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's Gary Vee talking about wine, right? So that's one part of it. But what made uh, Gary Vee Gary Vee is his personal brand also. So a founder telling their story and talking about their trials and struggles and decision making and all of those kinds of things, I, it makes them endearing to um, to the consumer. And consumers are looking for, they don't want to just buy a bottle of whatever you're trying to sell, right? They're trying to understand your, uh, you know, why should they buy from you specifically, you know? And, and if, they, if, you, if you have a story that they can relate to or, they can they know that when they're making that purchase it has a meaning right it has a meaning that you're gonna you go you will contribute 10 percent of your sales to saving the dolphins whatever that cause is and you're sharing that in your content content extends to customer testimonials video testimonials uh text write-ups reviews uh guest posts i mean you name it all day long i would i would do if i was out in i would be talking about every aspect of that and especially for the leather, leather shop i don't know if uh, i mean he, he says that he's turning it into a media company yep. i i would take that and um talk about how does he source that uh leather is it sustainable you know and, and how does he give back and all of all sorts of things like that that's going to just elevate it and not just do it on social platforms but take that content and make sure that you're deploying it on your on your, on your main site. I see so many brands that produce amazing content on these social platforms and YouTube and stuff. It just lives there. They never bring it back to the brand, you know? Yeah, yeah no, no, spot on. Uh, totally agree with you. And I think that last point is really critical as well because the key difference in a lot of brands in terms of success and massive success, hyper growth, if you will, um, and finding those unicorn pieces of creative, et cetera, is quantity. Quality matters, obviously, but the quantity, your ability to put out content at scale. Um, and to Sabir's point, you see a lot of brands doing amazing content on social and they don't re-leverage it for their site. Um, and their site looks stale and the site looks the way it did. I think one of the most profound things that I've seen, or profound is probably too uh, strong a word, but uh, th the most impactful things are sites that have something to do with uh, many of the... Uh, uh, brands that are out there, they'll have like some product that is very relevant for the moment. Um, and yet they'll still use the same imagery they had last year instead of, for example, showing how that product can be used right now, where you're trying to observe social distancing, where you're wearing a mask, et cetera, and show the relevance of that. They'll do it on social, but they won't show it on their site. <laughs> so to Spears point, do that. The other thing is I think brand is something you've got to keep through and through. Um, oftentimes you see brands do advertising at different stages of the funnel and they'll do brand at top of funnel, mid funnel, they'll do a little bit of brand and then the bottom will just be a retargeting ad with zero brand, include brand everywhere. Totally. Sweet, let's go to the next question. Next question comes in from John Plumley at John Plumley 20, selling an online education system. What opportunities do you all see with online tech or online teach rather, i.e. music lessons? Lots of uncertainty when kids go back to school, lots of parents will be seeking alternatives. Totally agree, John. What are your thoughts, Sabir? Completely the opposite. <laughs> so it's an amazing opportunity. You have any idea, like, 
I mean, Zubin, you've been involved in e-commerce uh, for a long time now, right? What yeah. you and I were expecting in 2045 happened in 2020. Yep. The timeline sped up 25 years, and that's there's reality to it. You know what else? Think, what else changed? Every grandmother knows what a Zoom call is. Do you understand that? Absolutely. Right? And every Absolutely. every teacher that was afraid of of using tech for they would not even email. I mean, my kids went through school. I could not email their teachers. It was insane, yep. right? And I had to schedule a phone call to talk to them. So that changed. Like the entire schooling system changed to this. I think what's going to happen is the the uh, the prevalence of uh, home education and and it, or or even complementing complementing the education. I think it's going to change. I hope that uh, all of us throughout the world. I think we wake up and we see that wow, you know, we can actually leverage uh, technology to extend ourselves, especially our kids, right? To help them. I mean, things like, um, uh, for example, tutoring, right? W why does uh, uh, Susie have to come to my home to teach my daughter yep. uh, a, a course, right? Why can't Susie be a professor in Florida that's amazing at that topic that I can get her on a Zoom call and I can pay her to teach me that? W what, what if that, what if John is an amazing a musician and I want my kid to learn music from oh, him yeah. and it doesn't matter if he lives in Georgia or he lives in San Diego it doesn't matter he can get on there and my kid can learn uh, the lessons regardless of where people live yeah I, I totally agree one of the things that I'll say uh, for John is what Sabir's mentioning like let's unpack that for a moment what if what if what if so what you want to do a is demonstrate that expertise you want to have your social profiles and whatnot demonstrate that you are the expert at whatever uh, music lesson you're teaching. Um, the reality is like the tech is there, right? You can set up a, uh, a you can book me or Calendly type calendar, calendar that has all your availability, that takes payment, that books you, all that stuff is there. And then you can have the video call however you want to do it. The key is making sure that people know that you exist. And the crazy part about this is you don't even need to be able to pro, uh, position yourself nationally even. Like for certain things, you could just do it low. I mean, there's plenty of opportunity within any local market, especially for music lessons, where you can start out local, start to get that penetration, put out your um, your content on YouTube, put out your content on Instagram, TikTok, et cetera. Start running some ads locally that demonstrate your expertise. Start getting some of the parents. And the thing about specifically around kids is as, as we all know uh, it's word of mouth, right? One kid takes a lesson, loves it. The next one takes it, so on and so forth. But look, start with making sure that your profile's out there. Get some targeted ads going and you'll be booked in no time. Cool. Let's go to the next one. Next question comes in from Alex Richardson, a friend. There we go. <laughs> Alex, how you doing, man? Alex Richardson, what's happening, brother? Um, so Alex Richardson asks, during COVID, what are your performance marketing priorities for accelerating e-com sales? How to beat Amazon? Sabir. Uh, those are two very different questions. Um, so how to beat Amazon, my, here's my position on that. Why are you trying to do that? <laughs> it's like, you know, I'll ask a different question that will not make sense for all either, right? Uh, how can you beat Google at search engine, right? You, you can't like it doesn't make sense for you to do that right it's it's it, the question should be more of how do you leverage amazon to actually uh scale and growth hack your business right and and benefit you right there are many schools of thought on on customer data and who owns it and all of that kind of stuff i get it but if you're not a retailer but you're a brand owner like it's your brand being sold on the platform regardless of where it's selling as long as it doesn't uh, hinder your your brand equity and and your brand positioning. Sell it. Make sure that your brand is represented well and and fully leverage the Amazon platform. You know, and it's a, it's a because Amazon is not just a selling platform. It's it's the uh, from a product search engine perspective, it's the number one product search engine. It's not Google, right? Yep. Google is a general search engine, not a product search engine, because Amazon gives you so much context into 
uh, you know, certainty related to your purchase. You know, for example, customer reviews, photos, mm -hmm. videos, you name it. People Return. like it, 3,000 reviews, whatever yeah. it is, you know, you're getting all of that context. So, so I think, yeah, uh, I agree with you on Amazon. Um, I think that's a, uh, we could spend two, three hours just talking about Amazon strategies. Let's talk about the marketing performance or performance marketing priorities. So my thought on this and, and when we're working with our clients, what we're the goal right now for many products, as Sabir mentioned, with the hockey stick growth, consumers want to purchase products online. There was a study uh, recently uh, that I was reading. It was by where to go. Um, it, it's quite interesting. What they were basically saying is that 55 percent of Americans have purchased online from websites and brands they'd never heard of before. Never heard of before three months ago. They're buying from them now. So what is the performance marketing key there? The key is people are coming to your site, they're buying stuff, right? But you want them to continue buying from you and you want them to become a customer for life. So in my mind, the performance marketing priority is making sure that they are aware of your entire catalog and that they become a customer for life. Because oftentimes right now, they're coming to purchase a very specific product that they need in the moment, but you might have many more products that are uh, pertinent to them, but they don't necessarily know that they need them right now. So putting together an effective SMS email retention strategy is critical so that you get them to come back and back and back. Any thoughts so, on this? Sure. So uh, there are two two buckets I would put it into, right? Number one, I'm going to share uh, th this stat, uh, and it's kind of updated now recently. Um, a digital consumer uh, consumes and, and touches your channel roughly, or your brand, roughly around nine times, right? So if you, yeah, from a marketing priority standpoint, if your brand is only focused on, let, let's say, Facebook marketing, and because that's the expertise you have or, mm -hmm. or the person you hired or whatever, that's their expertise. The thing is, now you're de dependent heav heavily on just, a, ju just the um, a population that exists on, on Facebook. So your site visitors are coming from everywhere. And typical matchback of, of um, site visitors tends to be between 60 to 70%. Right, so you're still missing forty percent of your traffic. That's not going to be on Facebook. It's not going to be on Instagram, right? So from that perspective, when when you're spreading your kind of your digital pixels and and social pixels, make sure that you spread it across and 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 invest in in that pixel to at least start collecting the data, and then um you know and then you could actually do to your point besides the e e email and SMS marketing. I would utilize it the same way, and I call it CRM, con re, you know, retargeting. Yep. Uh, and it's it's your SMS, it's your email, it's all of your digital pixels, it's all of your social pixels. So that now now I'm increasing my digital reach to that visitor that visited my site just now, right? So mm -hmm. that's that that's one uh, a giant priority there. Practical, uh, absolutely. Number two, uh, what I would do in any kind of work you do, I, I, it, people end up landing on your site, let's say, if, if that's the ultimate goal. Remove all uncertainty uh, from, from that. And during this kind of uh, world event that we are going through, I, I don't want to use that word because it kind of, YouTube blocks your content, by the way, <laughs> when you use those things, uh, those, those specific worlds. So the world event that we are going through right now, um, the biggest uncertainty in e-commerce is, uh, if I place my order, am I going to get it, right? So you that you have to answer that front and center, right? Because I there I personally have even gone through this. They said that you know it's going to ship in one to two days. I placed it. It's been four weeks. No communication. Nothing. It was not fraud. It was legitimate. But the brand never. And and the, these brands are big brands, and they are they were not communicating with me. They, yep. they did not tell me that hey, you know what? Uh, you know, in our warehouse, we have hundred people working on in a normal day. But during COVID, because of, uh, you know, with the, the pandemic and stuff like that, yep, I have 15 people, uh, you know, working every four hours. Okay, tell me that. I'm going to be yep. empathetic to, to you with that. So I, I think uh, uh, full transparency, especially around my order placement and removing that uncertainty is, is going to be huge. And you, your ROAS is going to just jump. Perfect. Thank you, Sabir. Uh, so we'll go to the next question. We're going to keep the next uh, 10 or so kind of high level. And okay. then feel free to reach out to Sabir. I mean, we can go into greater detail with you just because I want to make sure we get through everyone. All right. So uh, Teju, Bala, Teju at Teju Balaji asks, 
Hey, Zubin Monavi, what are your thoughts on Facebook, IG, and Big Commerce teaming up to create a direct to checkout feature on the platform? And how could this potentially play out for IG as a social marketplace? Could this rival Pinterest? So what Teju is asking us is really around Facebook shop and Instagram shopping. Um, the fact that it's not just big commerce, right? It's Shopify, it's big commerce, it's Magento, it's a number of them yep. that have direct integration. So the key there is that you can sell the products or a subset of the products that you have on your Shopify, big commerce, et cetera, uh, stores on Facebook marketplace. And once the order comes through, it basically processes directly in big commerce and the order appears there. And so you can fulfill it and manage that order and customer information the same way you would before. Uh, so be real quick, could this rival Pinterest? Um, Pinterest has been added for many years, right? Mm -hmm. It's one of the best social commerce platforms I've seen because it's also a search engine. So I, I think it's gonna take time because Instagram has tried this before and, and Facebook especially. Uh, it's been trying uh, doing a, quite a lot of tries, but I think a lot of people can take uh, a cue from Amazon and create a closed system to actually get get brands to actually sell really well and also for consumers to purchase on their platform. Perfect. Yeah. And the other thing I would say is that there's a lot of opportunity online right now and, and, and in the real world as well, but just a lot of opportunity. So I wouldn't look at it necessarily rivaling Pinterest, but in addition, the way I see Facebook Marketplace, I almost think about it like a uh, like a cart or a pop up in the side of a mall where you're already there and then you have a number of your products there and people can purchase because they're there. So the key is being where the consumer is and then having that experience specific to them. Um, thank you, Teju. Let's go to our next question. Next question comes in from Bryant Inman at Baron Von Bryant. My question is around structure and organization. I've been managing freelance contractors using Upwork and Fiverr. Do you think I should look to replace contractors with permanent employees? I worry scaling up with contractors to get messy on a nation, national worldwide scale. Sabir? Uh, so I've done this many times over. Um, uh, actually, th there's, a, there's a great site. Uh, I stopped using um, uh, Fiverr and Upwork because I, I just got more mature about like uh, freelancers and stuff. Uh, I actually use onlinejobs.ph. It's a, it's a Philippines, uh, like my man in Philippines kind of a thing, you know, um, and, and it has better talent on it. So that's, that's just one recommendation. They're not paying me to say that. I, I just use, it, use their platform. Uh, with freelancers, the thing is, it's like uh, kissing a lot of frogs, right? It, there are a lot of very, very poor quality freelancers out there, right? But if you can, uh, you know, set your expectations and, and set up your, your needs very carefully, you can actually find very talented freelancers that you could hire them and, and, and you own a slice of their time per week and, and they, they turn up uh, quite a lot, uh, quite a lot of work. I have a lot of actually my, some of my, uh, current partners that I have are actually used to be my freelancers in the past, and and I've utilized them on a lot of different projects to kind of determine their kind of their uh, skill set. So it, it depends on like your patience and and your learning, and you have to be very methodical, and and you can actually win really well with with the freelancers. And then you may want to get to a place where it makes sense because you may be overpaying the freelancer and for you to uh, switch to a permanent employee. Awesome. Yeah. Our next question comes in from. Drum roll, V Thakrar at V Thakrar. Breaking down the math and correlation between CAC and LTV and AOV, what should we be spending? So super high level, um, customer acquisition costs on one end, AOV on the other, lifetime value on the other. So Sabir, you wanna take this one? You want me to take it? Sure. Um, it depends on, I mean, I, the two key questions for V. Uh, number one would be, uh, what is your margin? You know, for on on the product, so that's number one question, right? Because uh, that all of these numbers you're you're seeing are derivative of that. You, like yep. if you if you don't have if it's a low margin business, uh, you know it doesn't matter what you're spending on CAC or LTV or whatever, unless you have very big bank or VCs uh, investing in your growth, you, you're not growth. gonna win. You're gonna fail big time. You know, number two is going to be um, has to do with is is it a product that has retention in it or replenishment? Meaning that, uh, you know, even if I am breaking even or losing a little bit money on that first acquisition because I acquired them as a cu customer for yep. my tomato sauce company, right? I, I know that I can sell them uh, four and a half tomato sauces in a year, and I'm going to make everything else that I'm going to make after that is going to be incremental through email marketing and very low cost retargeting and stuff like that. So, so that's what uh, that's the correlation I would 
uh, a drive, and it's very dependent on the category and and um, and and how do you balance those kinds of things out, you know? Yeah. So just to just to restate that um, for some of you, customer acquisition cost is what it costs you to basically sell one unit of your product, right? Average order value is how what is a basket size when they purchase. So uh, I go online, I buy uh, sauce from Sauce City, for example. Um, Shout out to South City, uh, who's watching right now. Uh, you you go to buy online, right? And I buy one or I buy two. On average, how many are they buying, right? So that's the average order value. Now, in order to determine if lifetime value is meaningful for your business or not, what Sabir's mentioning uh, is incredibly impactful. Everybody's talking about LTV nowadays because they're saying, don't just look at the first purchase. But the whole point of direct consumer is that you get that customer and now you can sell them subsequent times. But is your product actually something that somebody will purchase frequently? Um, is it a mattress where they're only going to purchase it once every two years? In which case you want to uh, factor everything against CAC and not LTV because your payback period on that is going to be two years or four years. Anyway, depends on the product, but definitely these things are meaningful on a short term basis. But again, look for if you're starting something out, it'd be great to find something that has higher LTV because ultimately you want to get that customer in your ecosystem. And if, again, you're selling the mattress, for example, they buy every two years, what do mattress companies do? Now they start to sell pillows and sheets and other stuff. Covers. That go buy. Exactly. All right, cool. Next question comes in from Riley Seberg at Riley Seberg. Thoughts on self-hosted e com platforms. A big conversation in our companies about data ownership and who we're enriching with that data this is a fantastic question riley one that we're seeing quite often i'm going to comment on it real quick and then uh pass it over to severe the key here is understanding what we're talking about in terms of data and segmenting that data so for example uh, you sell a product through again i was talking about the bubbly example earlier with ryan uh, bubbly sells their product uh through whole foods for example um, and, and they will get very little, they get no customer information, right? All they know is that they sold however many cases of this orange flavor versus the other one versus whatnot. So they just get to sell through information. When uh, Bubbly or any other brand, if they sell, for example, on Shopify, right? What are they getting? They're getting my name, they're getting Sabir's name, they're getting our address, they're getting all information about us. Plus, if they enrich it with the ad data that's coming in, um, and then they integrate it with Klaviyo and Yotpo and whatnot. They're getting all sorts of information on us. Now, the question is, what information does Shopify have? And why does it matter that Shopify has that information versus me? So the benefit, I think there's a very small um, and, and very specific use case why you would want to manage your own e platform to have all of that data and not let anyone else have access to it. But for 95% of organizations, Shopify, BigCommerce, Magento, having that information in addition to yourself should not impact the outcome of your business or the growth of your business. Um, it's really understanding what data set matters to you and what is going to move the needle long term for you and why an e-commerce platform having that data set would impact you. Sabir? So my view is very different. In 2020, <laughs> so the reality of you... I would love that, Mr. on. He doesn't agree with me. Uh, you know, living in an isolation is impossible, right? Uh, you know, you, in order for you to run your business, you're going to run advertisement with Facebook and, and Google and, and probably you're going to sell your widgets on Amazon, right? Those are the three biggest uh, data companies in the world right now, you know? Sure. So compared to that, looking at the e com platforms... That's like looking at a very small <laughs> issue compared to the gigantic issue of, of uh, data privacy and ownership and stuff like that, which is, you know, the, 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 the holy trinity of, of uh, Facebook, uh, Amazon and Google. Uh, so I think that's that's a um, on the data side of it. That's my view. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's a much bigger question there. Sure. But as far as self-hosted e-com platforms, there are practical and operational reasons why. Uh, you you want to make that decision. You make sure that you're you're asking those questions, and actually, uh, somebody from a finance perspective in your organization is actually jotting all of those things down to kind of looking at a like for like. Like uh, you know, I'm paying two thousand. I'm on Shopify Plus. Two thousand dollar price tag looks big to me, or for whatever reason. Yep. 
okay, or, or okay, you know, you're not replacing it like for like. Now you need to have uh, a tech department to handle your WooCommerce or, or or WordPress or you know, you know, whatever Oracle Commerce or IBM Commerce sure. or whatever you have. Are you going to invest in that kind of uh, uh, in infrastructure and in IT? Every head you have, every person that's walking around in your IT is on average is going to be 85 to 100K at a minimum, you know? So if you have six of those, that's 600K, you know? So just be very practical about, does it make sense from a financial st standpoint? And But there are if you are from an e-commerce revenue standpoint, you might be at a place, it makes full sense for you to take that on because now that actually, that fixed cost, is lower than what you are paying on all of the uh, online platforms. So it becomes a very practical decision you would need to make. So basically, Riley, DM us and we'll chat about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, let's go to the next question. The Dan Palin asks at the Dan Palin, can you address challenges of operating out of remote locations such as Alaska? Um, the reason why I, I uh, liked this question, I wanted to address it. Um, I don't know anything about operating out of remote locations such as Alaska, but what I do know about is that there are others doing it. And the key here, whether you're in a niche industry, ge geographically, you're in a certain area, reach out to others that are doing it. And you'll be surprised at how many of them are actually open to sharing their experiences with you and helping you navigate that for yourself. Cool. That's so, yep. So uh, I have plenty of friends who work from Bali and <laughs> you know all sorts of remote locations, mm -hmm. right? Uh, some of the challenges, operating challenges, what you need to do is it's, I, I would just turn this on, uh, on its head a little bit, find the right partners. You know, if, if you're working with a 3PL, make sure that, you know, you, you have vetted them and they do a great job, right? There are some realities to working from remote location. Connectivity is a big one, right? Uh, are, are you going to, it, it, is your business going to survive? Very key question. If you don't have access to the internet for a couple of hours or a couple of days, right? Um, I, I visited Bali and I was out of, uh, out of the Bali basically lost internet connection for three days. You know, if you're living in Bali and you're operating your business or Alaska or, or Hawaii or anywhere else, right. Can, can your li business live and work on its own without you being involved for three days? You know, if the answer is that, that means that you have a good operating system, uh, built for your company. Great. Thank you, Savir. Our next question comes in from Alexander. Chibik at Lights Vart. Thoughts on how to market a perfume brand starting from zero direct to consumer. What are your thoughts, Zubin? I think, and this is something that uh, we've been thinking about for some time with clients internally, et cetera, around products that you need to smell, touch, feel, taste, et cetera. Now, with that being said, let's look at other categories. Let's look at organizations that sell food online. Let's look at things like Freshly that have just exploded. You can't even taste the thing, right? But what they do is they bring you into every other aspect of that lifestyle except for that thing that they're selling, right? And they do that in terms of visually stimulating you otherwise. I think the key with uh, perfume is I don't know what the actual answer to this question is. Like I can't give you a definitive, but what I can tell you is that ha you have to know what your brand stands for and what your lifestyle is, who you're targeting, and make sure you continually reinforce that on your site. Because obviously it's not the situation where they're gonna go uh, into a Macy's or Nordstrom and smell it and then uh, you get them online. But take a look at like Lalabo, where it's infrequent in terms of the retail locations and yet they're selling their products online because there's some meaning and, and, and some story behind the brand. Sabir, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I think it's a reference point and replacing um, your senses. So let, let me explain. So references would be, you know, I would, if I was starting up a, a new perfume brand called Sabir, right? It smells spicy and I don't know, whatever, you mm -hmm. know, spicy pumpkin. Is, is, that how you, is that how you describe yourself? Spicy pumpkin? Yeah. Yeah. More or less, I, more or less yeah. <laughs> um, so um, what I would do is I would double down on influencers, right? If I cannot sense it, can I per, can I can I invest in somebody else's credibility, right? So if you have an influencer talking about a brand and and they are involved in beauty brands and they they do encourage 
and 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 people trust their judgment and stuff like that and they have a huge following and all stuff like that so if i can change that reference point where i don't have a message to go to but i have xyz influencer on instagram that always talks about beauty right i'm gonna first invest in that because i i, I want to at least get that credibility that that person is saying that this is amazing right i mean it's it's also same as very similar to when a new Samsung Galaxy comes out, you you cannot hold it in your hand. Only the influencers have access to it before there's a major launch or later launch, right? So you you are bought into the idea of actually purchasing that when it comes out because XYZ on 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 Instagram or YouTuber said yeah. that and you trust their decision. And now you're excited about it and you're doing research and you're moving from just general intent to purchase intent from, from that perspective, right? Well, so when it, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so that's number one. Number two, similar to that, I would I would also look into distribution channels and sampling, right? For example, uh, there are a lot of package insert programs that a lot of uh, direct marketers as well as e-commerce marketers uh, use. Like, if you were to, uh, you know, uh, you know, nobody is paying me to say this, but like 800 flowers. When when you make that purchase, they give you a nice package that comes with it. It says, "Thank you for your purchase. Here are some special yep. offers." When you open that up, your perfume, the Chibik uh, perfume could be in there that that I could get, try it, get a small sample, I could try it and see how it goes, right? And there's a whole industry of package insert program providers that you can work with those kind of agencies to actually take your product, deploy it into the other people's packages uh, so that when they get it, they get to try it and then you can give them some sort of an offer to come to you, Chibik.com to actually purchase your perfume. Sabir, just a quick heads up, you've already given uh your goal of value for today. So everything beyond this is just great. Oh, Sabir is amazing. Um, <laughs> now you know I'm on. Um, one example of this real quick, and, and we've got uh, several more questions. So we're just going to go lightning round after this. But one example of this that I would, uh, of what Sabir was mentioning is Dr. Squatch. Um, never oh, yeah. tried their product, but I see their ads all the time. They rely on other people to go, wow, this smells so good. Wow, this smells so good. So you feel like this is going to smell good. Anyway, they'd love I mean, to actually, just to add on to it, I'm very familiar with that brand. Uh, if humor is part of your brand, Chibik, I would recommend look, checking out some of those Dollar Shave Club and a few others in addition to Dr. Squatch. That uh, It's a soap company. It's very interesting how they uh, convey smell and ingredients and stuff like that in, in, a, in a very humorous uh, video that has gotten like millions of views and it went viral. And if spicy pumpkin is your flavor, then reach out to Sabir and start a line with him. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next question. Comes in from Ricardo Thainer, uh, at Ricardo Thainer. So we're gonna go lightning round through these. What's the one item you can think of that is not being sold online yet? I can't think of anything. <laughs> you can find any, you can literally find it. Oh yeah, I mean, um, no, not not even, I mean, live animals is something that I was thinking, right? Uh, if you wanna die, you know, if you wanna buy a parrot or, or a cat or something like that, but people are doing that also. Uh, and oh, and if you think about it, if you extend that question to just non-transactional, meaning like to be able to buy as in like, you don't necessarily have to transact, but you can actually go to the point of like, you make that decision online, then I agree with you. Um, Ricardo, you got us thinking. I'll see if I can think of anything. Uh, next question comes in from Axe Capital at Axe Capital LLC. <laughs> this is very funny. So what's up? It's Macy's Do, account. Do you know what Axe Capital is? No. From Showtime Special, uh, you know, the, the movie, the series, Billions. Is that oh, wow. <laughs> Sorry. I find it very humorous. It might be a real. It might um, be a real Axe Capital LLC. <laughs> so, uh, so here is one. So it's uh, is Macy's a candidate for takeover or buyout in Wall Street to reboot their DNA to full digital? Uh, they sell five billion online already. P.S. My English sucks mucho. It doesn't at all. Thank you so much for the question. Your English is great. Sabir. Um, there there are plenty of retail brands right now that are going through bankruptcy uh, i do follow uh, bank bankruptcy filings and stuff like that uh neiman marcus uh, jc pennies i mean uh, j crew uh, you know uh, there are plenty of them and yep. what's interesting is that's this is a very interesting question because what's happening is um uh, i'm sure zubin you know alex murr yep yep so he's one of those guys like uh online entrepreneur uh, yep. made a success, uh, you know, e-commerce and online and stuff like that. Right. And, and those are the guys, uh, that are going, I think Ty Lopez is another one that recently actually made a huge acquisition, uh, similar to that too. 
they're they're looking at the brand equity they're looking at the customer list and saying that okay you know what i don't need any of the retail stuff you know this could become an online business and and they're taking like they would take like macy's.com with the macy's list and then invest in it because they know that that's a already established brand and established totally. uh, equity that they can take and 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 leverage and minus all of the headache of of leasing and uh you know uh, physical uh, assets yep. and stuff like that they don't have to worry about that and they'll just go with all the digital assets and crm totally totally cool uh next question comes in from james flynn at james flynn underscore two given traditional retail is still such a huge market do you think SaaS companies are missing a revenue stream by not having a physical product um interesting so, yeah go ahead Zubin. Uh, my thought on this is that it's a different business model altogether, right? The entire purpose of SaaS, the benefit of SaaS is that lack of physical footprint, um, as well as the fact that you can scale. You build once, you sell many, 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 many times. Um, and so I don't know that they're necessarily missing out, uh, especially the SaaS companies that are enabling retail and the ones that are enabling online. So perhaps the question is, can, they, can there be more SaaS companies that enable retail? Absolutely, they're out there. But in terms of them missing a revenue stream, um, I, I don't think so, Sabir. I think it's a different business model. No, I, I think so. Here, here's my thought on this. Um, uh, take a company like Kroger, right? Very traditional retailer, right? Uh, they were working with a SaaS company. I forgot their name. Uh, something fifty nine. Uh, they rebranded it. Uh, AI based algorithm, uh, SaaS. It's all about data, data analytics, and and intelligence and stuff like that, right? They ended up besides working with them, they ended up actually acquiring the company, right? So the smarter retailers yep. realize uh, if, the, if the SaaS company brings a tremendous value to them, that means that also what they, they could also bring value to their competitors. So they're going and actually acquiring these SaaS companies uh, to, to make, make it part of their offering to kind of take them out of the market so that competition doesn't have access to that intelligence or s secret sauce or whatever you want to call it, right? Uh, on the other side of it, Having a physical product, I think we will see a lot more products that are smart devices and smart, like magic mirror type type things, where uh, SaaS, where the the product has SaaS and digital aspects and social aspects to it, but it's actually a physical product that sits inside of a retail establishment. Sure, sure, or like a Peloton or whatnot that requires it's a physical product that requires a SaaS component. All right, two more questions. Next question is from Ramon Mena. Uh, Licharak, uh, Ramon Menor Licharak, moving from physical retail to e commerce, social networking create traction. But how can I build the experience when you have lots of products to show? By the way, I sell books. Thank you for that <laughs> context. It's actually helpful. Very helpful. Um, so here's the thing I'm, I'm, I, I don't know what kind of books. I mean, because even within books, there are so many categories. And, and I don't know if you're in a niche, if, if, you, if, it, if these are technical books, law books, or vintage books. And, uh, and stuff like that. I think if you if you are in a niche and not just general market that you're competing against Amazon, even for Barnes and Noble, it's hard to compete against my Amazon, right? Uh, so if you are in that sort of a experience, I think you could take a lot of a lot of those uh, real world or traditional experiences, right? Having an author and 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 reviewing it and having an audience and stuff like that. All of that translates to social content and and. And, and creative content that you could bring to, to build those kind of experiences. So that's number one. Number two, uh, if you have a general store with let's say a million titles, right? Can you create uh, online only brands that are specific to niches? Sure. Like legallawlibrary.com, right? Mm -hmm. that's, that's not Zubin bookstore, right? But that's one online brand you have, it doesn't have to match your physical store. And you don't. What's great about it is you don't have to worry about all of the uh, baggage that you have because of your logo or whatever, because you're starting from zero, <laughs> you know. And you could call it and do whatever with it you wish, and you could create this completely an online experience that kind of extends your brand. And you totally. don't have to even mention Zubin Bookstore. It it could be completely legallawlibrary.com, and then underneath it it says Zubin Bookstore LLC. You know. It's almost like inconsequential. Awesome. Last question comes in from Gustavo, Gustavo. Yep. Munoz Castro. Sup, Zubin. Sup, Gustavo. Uh, my wife is making an online store for the first time, selling a kid's toy. 
Should she go all in on Facebook Marketplace or startup on Shopify and send all traffic there? My thoughts on this is multi-channel threading is key. You don't want to distribute your efforts too much, but you don't want to just stay in one place. When you're starting out to begin with, you're going to be hard pressed to get people over to your Shopify store. However, build your Shopify store, connect it with Facebook Marketplace. So it's feeding Facebook Marketplace. When someone places an order there, it comes into here. You start to send emails from here, SMS from here, and you start to get customers here. Sabir? Uh, selling a kid's toy, um, the first place I will go and actually definitely you need to have your Shopify and, and make sure that you're, you're uh, publishing your catalog, not just Facebook, uh, because also moms exist on quite a lot in droves on Pinterest. I would definitely put it on there. Mm -hmm. But the number one people keep on ignoring is is uh, Google is amazing at traffic, you know. And yep. Did you know, and, uh, Zubin, I know that you, ha you have a young, young child, right? Um, the number one video uh on youtube from a number of views perspective is a kid's cartoon yep with 6.3 billion yep 6.3 billion with a b right that's just one there's also this uh a russian cartoon with bears on it and stuff each one of their episodes has a billion views each and that's yep. all and and kids are watching they have moved from the tv their their, their tv is on their ipad and it's, yep. it's youtube that's what they're watching I would run my ads against that and, and try to see, because I'm sure that because of billions of views, it's hard to get sponsorship within, but at least utilize YouTube ads to run my ads against those videos to, to bring uh, a lot of interest and uh, huge traction. And obviously you have to do all the other things you need to do with, with uh, social and uh, things of that nature on, on Facebook and Instagram, and especially Pinterest, if you're targeting moms. Severe. This was absolutely fantastic. Um, I hope the audience got a lot of value. Uh, I realized three things today. Two of them I already knew. One, that you're amazing. Thank uh, you. That you're able you to Thank you for having me. Two, that the audience loves you. Just look at the comments. But the third one that I wasn't aware of is that there's actually quite a bit of demand for Sabir by Sabir spicy pumpkin. So <laughs> let's talk about that offline. Actually, Adriano is a client of mine in Canada. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Love um, you, Adriano. He, uh, as I mentioned, tomato sauce, and, and he actually makes pasta sauce. He's a ma manufacturer. Marinellisauce.com. Marinellisauce.com. Uh, Sabir, we're going to have to do this more frequently. Loved having you on. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for uh, having me. Absolutely. Uh, the rest of you, thank you so much for tuning in, and we will see you very soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.